Deuteronomy chapter 5, starting verse 8, hear the word of the Lord. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his holy word. When we were, when we were in, Mary and I were in Ethiopia, we spent about six months in a small Bible college uh, in a town called southern Ethiopia called uh, Dilla. Uh, the, the, the Bible college had a small library full of donated books, actually not a bad sized library for a small college. Uh, but it was closed because the students, or whatever, I'm not exactly remember the reason, something they weren't keeping the books in order, is that it? Yeah, okay, Mary's nodding her head, she remembers. And, uh, and so no one was um, um, keeping, overseeing the library, so, so the students couldn't use it. They closed the, in other words, people gave to stock this library in rural Ethiopia, and it was totally closed. No one could use it. And so I volunteered to be the librarian so the students could come and read, and I thought, it didn't, you know, it didn't make much sense to have a library that no one can use. I mean, what is a library for? Is it for keeping in books? Or is it for helping readers? I've, and I've heard stories like that over and over again, uh, even in Christian organizations, churches and others, Bible colleges and so forth, having raised, you know, often having raised money for something and built something, maybe a library or having gotten a VCR. Um, you know, can't move the VCR from da- upstairs to downstairs so we can show the Jesus film to the poor kids because you might damage the VCR. And uh, uh, chairs, you know, a church has folding chairs, and well, maybe, the, you know, the, the youth ministry, the, those rambunctious kids might damage our chairs, so we might have to shut down the whole ministry. And uh, churches, I've heard in this, even in this area, that other churches have built gyms, and uh, then guess what? The kids come, they play ball, and guess what happens? They get the gym dirty. We can't have that, so they close down the whole gym, and the whole ministry is shut down. And, and on and on, like that, when, when the people, Christians, they, they, they do something, they raise money for something, and then They forget what it's for. It's just amazing how easily people forget what or who something is for and get more caught up in protecting it, you know, whatever it is, the books. I'd rather have all the books get stolen, you know, out there. At least someone's likely to read, more likely to read them if they're out there than they are locked in a library that no one can get into. Or VCRs or chairs or gyms or vans or buses or, or gym, you know, gyms, you know. Uh, they get caught up in protecting that stuff. And really, it's about then protecting our status. Look what a nice gym we have. Look what a nice library we have. You know, and you know, uh, nice electronics, nice chairs, uh, rather than, you know, what the ministry was supposed to be for. We, 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 forget, let, let, we forget to let them do what, you know, maybe what the gym is supposed to be for. They come in, they'll scuff up the place. At, at the YMCA, uh, the GW swim team has to come practice late in the evening, like you know, sometimes uh, 8 p.m., uh, because the old folks have to have their water aerobics earlier. Got another Y member here. He may object. I don't know what he thinks of that. But I, I wonder, though, if they've forgotten what the Y in YMCA stands for. Uh, what, about, what about church? What about, what about worship? What or who is it for? Well, there are, in my opinion... Basically, three types of churches, at least those among, around us. Uh, those first who think the church is for themselves. They may never say that, but you can tell by the way they live. So the, the hymns they sing, the suits and ties and dresses they wear, the, the things they preach on, the old translation they use, the style of preaching is what makes them feel comfortable. It's what they're used to. It's what they grew up with. It's, it may, they're comfortable with it. Maybe it's the old-time religion or, or, or whatever. I mean, we, we sing a lot of... I don't know if anyone noticed this. Seeing a lot of kind of 70s uh, and 80s choruses in this, in this church, often, often that's because I'm the one choosing the songs, and that's what I'm most comfortable with. I love you, Lord. Good old 70s. Whatever. And, uh, but, you know, but if that's all you do, if that's all about us, well, that's a problem. Then others, though, the second type is that the church is for those outside. Um, whatever draws in the crowds. So everything is geared toward attracting people outside. Making them more comfortable. Uh, you gotta have, you know, you gotta have the jeans and the untucked shirt. It's kind of the uniform these days of, of, the, of a certain style of church. Um, 
Yeah, I won't tell that story. Uh, and uh, you know, and um, preaching is replaced by a, a talk from a guy sitting on a stool with, in jeans and an untucked shirt, of course. And a lot of attention is played to, to graphics and lights and multi. I'm not putting down untucked shirts. Okay, you can wear untucked shirts if you want. There's just it's such a uniform among the stuff. But it, it, a lot of attention, again, is the multimedia. You got, of course, contemporary music that's taken for granted. You got to engage all the senses with, with images and drama and skits and dance and all that kind of stuff. Everything else that is exciting and appealing to our culture today, because it's for those outside. Church, they say, and some of them say this explicitly, church is for those outside, out there. And then there are a lot of people who have got to have a as-you-like-it attitude about worship. Yeah, you, you know, it's talking about the about what's right worship for them. That 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 those people. That's as ridiculous as talking about the right kind of food. You know, you might like Chinese food, or you might like Italian, or you might like Mexican, or you know, American, whatever. It's whatever you like. It's to your taste. What suits you. And so they, the same mentality comes to church. You, you might like traditional, you might like your hymns, or you might like contemporary, or you like expositional preaching, or maybe you like secret sensitive kind of topical messages, or maybe you like liturgical, you know, just in these old, you know, robes and chanting and incense and all that. Whatever, it's up to you. Worship is, to paraphrase Abraham Lincoln, of the people, by the people, and for the people. And then there's a third option. The worship is not first about the people in here, about us, or the people out there, but the God up there. Maybe, just maybe, there's an audience of one that we need to attend to. In the first commandment, God demands to be the only one we serve, to give worship that is worth-ship to. In the second commandment, God demands that all worship be done as he directs. And this makes the second commandment one of the most widely uh, and blatantly disobeyed of the commandments, one frequently violated even by religious church-going people, and perhaps the most incomprehensible of the Ten Commandments to many people, especially today. Uh, the Lord tells us, you shall not make, notice the way that commandment is put, you shall not make for yourself a carved image. And it goes on. Notice that for yourself. Now, if you omitted that phrase, for yourself, it would, it would still mean the same thing. You know, you shall not make a carved image, and so on. But, but it wouldn't have the emphasis that the commandment is about. Now, that phrase is there for a reason. Because that, I think, is the essence of the commandment. For yourself. Worship is not about yourself. But as soon as we're unable or unwilling to worship God in spirit and in truth, we start making worship that's for ourselves to make us feel comfortable, whether it be the old hymns or the new songs, exciting contemporary songs, or uh, the ways that will draw in the crowds or ways that just remind us of the good old days, the good old 70s. You know, if, it's, if it's for us, it's about us. They express who we are, what we want, and our own perverted desire to control God, to kind of put him on our short leash. When we worship God the way we think God should be worshipped, we become the arbitrators uh, over his worship. We become then gods. We take to ourselves the right to stand over God and tell him, this is the right way that you are to be served, God. We're, we're going to tell you, God, how you are to be served. And that very attitude the very arrogance that would come to God in the way we think best is at the heart, the opposite of worship. And it really doesn't matter how you do it, whether you're a traditional or contemporary or liturgical or expositional, Puritan-like, if that's your attitude, he's going to be done my way, your worship is all wrong. Worship is a humble, reverent bowing of the knee, accepting his attitude uh, his, I should say, his, his, his guilty verdict on our sins, accepting that the only way that we can be saved is if God does something for us that we can't at all do for ourselves. So worship looks to the cross and accepts that sacrifice and says, you are Lord. But when we make worship for ourselves, we, say, we think we know. We know better about what we need to get to God, about how he should be worshipped. 
And so to put a fine point on it, worship that comes from us, it's a product of our imagination, our planning our, for our purposes to suit our needs, to make us feel the way we want to feel, that is not real worship of God at all. It's not even something innocent and intolerable. It's not an optional way of doing things, you know, just for people who are kind of into that kind of thing. Worship, if it is to be worship of God at all, must be of God, by God, and for God. Otherwise, it's nothing other than damnable idolatry. It's our own self-worship. Notice that phrase, you shall not make for yourself. It's very difficult for people in our day to understand, even sympathize with. A, a day in which we talk about worship styles. It's a common phrase out there, worship styles. When the reigning idea of in many, even in many churches seems to be that worship is all a matter of preference, with our taste being the final judge of what's acceptable and what's not, God says, you shall not make for yourself. We say, go ahead, make for yourself a worship experience that suits you, that appeals to seniors or millennials or bikers or cowboys or white people or black people or Chinese people or whatever group you're trying to appeal to. We talk a lot about worship and then forget the very one it is supposed to be about. And the second commandment then comes screaming to us, worship is not for us, it's for God. And for it to be real, it has to be done God's way. Period. The second commandment tells us you can't determine how God is worshipped. But idols, don't make the carved image, don't bow to it, idols, um, they stand for the way of the life of the people who worship them. They stand for the people. Um, in that day, in Moses' day, that the gods were worshipped, you know, according to their um, um, the, their way of life, their their culture, from the appearance of the temples to the altars to the role of the priest. It all reflected as an expression of of the values of the art, of the aesthetics, the ideals of the culture of of the people. Uh, it was of, by, and for the people. It was a celebration of them. That's what their religion was. So like in Roman days, uh, when the Christians would not sacrifice a pinch, an in, uh, a pinch of, of, of incense to the emperor and, and say, um, what, did they, what would it be, hail, hail to the Caesar, uh, a sacrifice to the genius, they call it, the, the spirit of the emperor. Um, when Christians refused to do that, the, the Romans saw that not only as irreligious, but just unpatriotic. You're a traitor. You're not joining with us. But the Christians couldn't do it. And uh, in idolatry, whether it's like that or any other, it, it, the worship meets the needs of the culture, maybe of the state, of the society, maybe to hold them together, of the patriotism. And, and surely we think there isn't anything wrong with that. And maybe there's not if he's you know, saluting a flag before a football game, which is a fine place to do salute a flag. But what about the worship of God? People say, well, there's nothing wrong with that in, in worship of God. But, oh, but there is. God tells the Israelites that his worship, worship is not merely an expression of their culture. It's of the Lord, by the Lord, and for the Lord. He is worshipped by meek, teachable hearts who come to hear God's word, have their sins exposed by it, and offer their lives as a living sacrifice to him. It is not self-expression that God wants out of us. It's submission that God's after. You know, in the book of Exodus, when, when the Lord describes how to make the tabernacle, you know, you ever read through all that? And you think, oh, I start to glaze over. So many details. Well, I had to read. This is the hard part to get through the Bible. And uh, you, you, about the tabernacle and the altar and the Ark of the Covenant and all of that, other decorations and other things. You don't even know exactly what they are. He gives very detailed instructions. He leaves nothing to their imagination. You think of that. Why are there so many details? God is like a control freak there. Even to the colors of the threads. You know, he describes the, this, these threads are supposed to be these colors. It's as though he is communicating to them that their worship is not something they can just kind of concoct out of their own creative thinking. Uh, that they should not think for themselves how to create the best worship experience to visitors of the tabernacle. I mean, you want to draw in as many visitors to the tabernacle as you can. Um, no, that's not what they were thinking. But that this will all be done as the Lord determines. 
this is why it's so seriously wrong to think you can worship him in, in any way of, of our choosing. Some think that as long as people are sincere, well, they're sincere, it's okay. But, you know, when Moses was on Mount Sinai getting the Ten Commandments, Aaron was sincere. He was sincerely making a golden calf and declared that. He, made, he sincerely makes this golden calf and declares sincerely, this is your God, O Israel. And then they call a feast, sincerely, I assume, uh, for the Lord. You know, and if you read the passage, it's all capital letters. Lord means Yahweh. It's not just any God. He means, he means the very God who, this is the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, Aaron says. This, and, and, and this image that he made, this golden calf, was, was to represent this God. Uh, now, many people assume that Aaron was making another God to worship and so violating the first commandment. But no, he made an image, a golden calf, and then called the image the Lord, Yahweh. He said, this was the God that brought us out of the land of Egypt. The, the people, remember, they were getting nervous because where's Moses? He had been gone for so long. Moses, as God prophet, had represented God to, to the people. And, and their faith is so weak that they needed, they needed something that they could see, someone that, something they could look at. Before it had been Moses, and now they needed someone to remind them of God. And so Aaron made another image of God for them. But the problem is, it was for them, for a human purpose. Uh, it was a violation, not of the first, but of the second commandment. Uh, here in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 4, verse 15, we saw a week or two ago, uh, they were reminded that you saw no form on the day that the Lord spoke to you. Or they heard his word, but they saw his works, not, in, not him himself. And, so, and they said, so don't make an image to use in worship. And again, we need to be careful because this, we, we read this and think, what does this have to do? We don't make idols. That's not in our culture anymore. That's all gone. Uh, th this is, you know, we be careful. We don't think this is an old, irrelevant warning. It really doesn't apply to us anymore. because we're, we're past that stage in human evolution. Um, no, we're not. But, you know, the Eastern Orthodox Church draws in evangelical Christians today, just a couple, just was last year, uh, the so-called Bible answer man, Hank Hanegraaff, converted, supposed to be an evangelical Christian, converted to Eastern Orthodoxy, and now burns incense to images. Okay, so that's going on now, to icons, they call them, because, and, and this happens to among evangelical Christians because people aren't careful about images in worship. Now, the Eastern Orthodox claim to have perfectly preserved the practices of the apostolic church unchanged, unaltered from the very beginning, but they use icons, images, in worship. And the truth is that the early church strictly prohibited icons. Uh, they knew that the second commandment set them apart from a pagan culture with its, all its images. And so they, they allowed, the early church allowed no images in the church, no likeness of any figure whatsoever to be used uh, in worship. Even as late as the mid 300s, the fourth century, a man named Apophanius, Apophanius I, I write his name all the time, but I don't hardly ever say it. Apophanias uh, is a bishop in, from Salamis. He was traveling and um, we call it Israel or Palestine and he comes into a church to pray and there's a curtain there with a, some kind of image on it. He, he said he didn't remember exactly what it was of Christ or some other perfect curtain just as a decoration and he was angry. He, this, this bishop, he tore it down, tore it to shreds, gave it to the deacon there at in, in the church and sold, told him to go give the, 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 the rags now to some poor person who needed them. And that's the way the early church was about images in the church. Okay, you get stories like this when you have a pastor as a PhD in church history. It comes, it comes out like that. Uh, but uh, that was the consensus of the early church for the first four centuries. So this, this claim that, you know, from the early, we preserved the practices of the early church from the beginning, and now we're, just like they did, we're bowing before icons. Okay, that's, that's false. You could use stronger terms than that, but it's just false. So, and... Uh, worship, again, must be done God's way, and it prohibits images. And even the words of the Lord Jesus show that God demands that he be the Lord over his worship. In John chapter 4, a Samaritan woman, remember that story? Uh, as they, as at the well, tries to debate with him. Got to have a debate about worship. I'm a Samaritan, he's a Jew, let's debate worship. What's the best place to worship? And uh, Jesus tells her, God is spirit, and those who worship him... Um, you know, so he didn't say, well, you should go to Jerusalem and do that thing. But he doesn't also say it doesn't matter where you worship either. He doesn't say that either, does he? Or matter how you worship. You, those who worship must worship, must worship in spirit and truth. 
uh, maybe we're not good. That's not our passage for today. But, you know, some people all gravitate toward the spirit. Well, it's in your heart. It's sincere. Um, but notice the insistent, kind of irksome, uh, immovable word Jesus put in there. Must. You must worship God's way in spirit and in truth. The second commandment is still alive, and it still tells us that God demands that worship must be his way. Uh, this is what makes the second commandment so hard for people to understand. God is saying that worship isn't really for people at all. It's for him. And when there is a group of people who understand that, who assemble in worship, not just for the socializing or the familiar music or the sense of having fulfilled an obligation, a weekly ritual, but out of love for him, those people, he says in the commandment, remember, he will bless them, those thousands, he will love them. On the other hand, it's the people who don't seek to make worship um, um, about him that he is angry against. But it's the people who don't seek to make worship for themselves. They are making it for themselves. Uh, those God commits to make sure they will get something out of it. That's sort of the irony. You come to worship wanting really sincerely to worship God. You're not thinking, I want this for myself. You want to worship God. You get something out of it. God sh makes sure he blesses you. Those who come, I want something out of this church for myself. I want to feel my way or whatever. They're, those God opposes. So while, they, while those people who think they can bend worship for their purposes, God says he will pursue. He'll be against them generation after generation. So God reserves the right to himself to, to describe how he, be, he will be worshipped. First, he says, use no images in our worship. Any use of an image to pray to or through or kind of help us focus our, um, our prayers, our devotion, or to somehow bring a blessing on us is absolutely uh, forbidden. And it's amazing how often we make something we can see into like some, some image that gives us power. I saw some guy on some YouTube video. I know his name, Bob Larson, yeah. yeah it's a, um, supposed to be casting out demons out of someone, and he's using the Bible like it was a magic wand, waving it over people's heads. And the, the book itself became an image that has the power, that, that, that brings God's blessing. Yeah. Not the words, just the book. You understand the difference. Uh, and and uh, no, that's what the second commandment is against. Don't use objects that you can see somehow as conduits of, of God's power. D uh, doing that, because there, there, are, there are our attempts, and they always fall short of his glory. They diminish, they insult his glory. They, they make him something look like, well, he, his power can be controlled with the waving of a Bible or some kind of whatever magic wand of, 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 a, of a cross. Uh, just last night, we were seeing a movie, Tom Cruise movie. It was um, American-made, I think it was. And uh, a, a drug smuggler, right, uh, from Col Columbia, just... Uh, you, planes and trying to dodge American DEA agents and to get drugs in the U.S. And he, of course, he put a cross on his um, cockpit window there as a, as a lucky charm to help him in his drug smuggling. That's the way people think. God will help me if I put the ob The object ensures God's blessing. Well, no, it doesn't. In fact, it may ensure God's opposition. Now, you notice something odd about the commandment as we read about it? It makes it stand out from all the rest. There's something odd about this commandment. This is different, I think, from all the other commandments. Notice how specific it is. The rest, kind of, the rest of the commandments, leave it up to us kind of with, to, to define with integrity what, what makes the, you know, what violating them means. Um, you know, we can define for ourselves what, what does it mean to take the name of the Lord in vain? You know, see, he doesn't have a long, when it comes to that, doesn't have a long list, don't use these words, don't use these terms. No, he just says, don't take the name of the Lord in vain. Define for ourselves what it means to not work on the Sabbath or what it means to honor your parents or uh, to not murder or not commit adultery or, or not stealing or not slandering. You know, those commands are very, do not do that. Um, he, he doesn't have to exactly describe the action that is required or prohibited in those other commandments, if you think about it. Just, just, he says, you know, like, do not murder. Oh, what's murder? We have a couple, law, we have one lawyer, I guess that's right, and a law student, you know, law is all about it. You got to define exactly what these things mean, and so often a lot of boring detail. But here, but most of the commandments don't do that, um, say with murder. Well, we can figure that out for ourselves with, with the help of other scripture. 
Uh, when, when, when is a killing a murderer or not? But with this commandment, it's not like that. Uh, it's not like the others. It's not. You think about what God could have done. It, he didn't say, do not commit idolatry and be done with it. But it's very short, like many, most of the other ones are. Leaving it up to us to decide for ourselves what makes for idolatry. No, what is prohibited is exactly described. Isn't that odd? interesting? You know, he didn't do that with murder. He didn't say, don't sneak up behind your enemy with a club and bash him in the head until he's dead. Or, and then go on, don't stab him in the back. Don't, he didn't do that. He just says, do not murder. Because we can figure out what murder is. Here, he, he, he didn't say, do not commit idolatry. Why is that? Why does he describe specifically what not to do? And here what not to do is don't make an image and bow down to it. You have an object, something you can see, and you worship to or through or with that thing. Don't do that. And those are two elements. Notice the two elements that are required. There's an image and bowing to it. Now, is it, is it wrong to have images, uh, to, to have art on your walls, to have pictures in, of your family, uh, maybe of your ancestors who have passed away. Is that wrong? Not necessarily. No, it's not. Uh, not if you don't bow down to them, if you're not using them in worship somehow. It's not the photo of your past family members that is wrong, but the jostics, the prayers offered to them as though they can hear you, the food offered to them as though they can eat it, the money burned to them as though they can you know, spend it. Somehow that transfers it to them. Decorations, photos, pictures on your wall to remember past people, ancestors, art, uh, is not prohibited. God even tells Moses to make carvings of cherubim to decorate the Ark of the Covenant. That seems strange, doesn't it, in light of this commandment? But it's not. But some people look at that and say, oh, well, he made art, uh, carvings of cherubim. See? Icons are acceptable. Just like we bow to images of Mary and Saint whoever. But no, uh, nowhere are those images of the cherubim used in worship. They're never bowed to or before or used in any way in worship. They're just decorations in, in, the, in, the, in the tabernacle, in the temple. Decorations are fine. Nothing wrong with decorations, with art. Icons, really idols, are not. And what is prohibited is exactly described. Why did he do that, do you think? It's not left up to ourselves to decide whether we've committed idolatry because people always lie to protect their idols. In Romans 1, Paul describes um, how God's invisible, God's invisible attributes, his eternal power, that he could create this whole universe, that there is a God, have been, he says, have been clearly perceived. People know that. But people suppress the truth. And they exchange the, the worship of the true God, he says, for images, for, for idols, for icons. That, that is, idolatry arises from an exchange. You have the truth already because it's there. You have that truth, but you exchange it for a lie that you prefer instead. You like the lie rather than the truth. So that's where idolatry comes from. It's out of a suppression of the truth. It, it arises from lying. We always lie to support our idols. And I've seen this literally in dealing with Eastern Orthodox people who will claim with a straight face, I guess a straight face, because most of the time it's through the computer and I can't really see their face, but straight words on the, on the screen, uh, that they're bowing to an image. They're doing exactly what is clearly described and prohibited in the second commandment. I mean, they're doing exactly what the second commandment says not to do, that that's not violating the commandment. I mean, how, how do you get away with that? Well, because they're suppressing the truth. They're worshiping, they'll say, though, well, we're not worshiping idols. Uh, we're venerating icons. And that's an entirely different thing. Sure, it looks the same, but it, it's entirely different, they say. But the second, second commandment doesn't say, don't commit idolatry. No, it describes exactly what not to do. Don't make any image and then bow to it. But they lie, first to themselves, so they can do what the commandment says not to do. And I'll say all that not to condemn them, make us feel better. Because if they'll do that with their literal idols, no matter what they call them, think how much more likely we are to do that with our non-literal idols. 
Oh, we don't idolize our spouse, we say. We, we love them. We don't live for our kids, we say. We are just focusing on the family. We don't idolize sports, we say. Just make sure you're out by 12 so we can get the whole game. We don't, you know, we'll miss church to go on traveling teams because, well, it's only for a few years. We don't serve the money God, we say. We've just got bills to pay. We've got responsibilities, a family to support. We'll come back to church when we have a big enough bank account. We always lie to protect our idols. Why does God take his worship so seriously? What's the, what's the reason that this makes it into the Ten Commandments? This, of all, all the things, this is probably the one commandment most even secular people, or not even, even especially secular people, and why is this here? Well, in the middle of verse 5, he says, for, or because, so here comes the reason. This is why he's commanded this. I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. He is jealous. That means that he wants no rival to our affections for him. Just like a husband or wife, rightly jealous that his or her spouse not have another boy or girlfriend on the side. You know, it's not good enough. Just the spouse pledges, okay, honey. Uh, yeah, sure, I got a few on the side, but uh, you're my most loved, so don't worry about it. Okay, that doesn't fly with any, anybody I know. It's not good enough to be the most loved. Oh, honey, you're, you're 51% of my love, maybe even a little bit more, and divide the rest among other affections, among other lovers. No, no that doesn't work. That work with your husband or wife, it's not going to work with God. In the second commandment, God demands that he be our only love, our only object of worship. That we have no other gods, and if we do love anything or anyone else, like a, like a wife or a husband, we love them for the ways they bring us closer to God. We love other people or things uh, because we see in them something of the goodness of God, they're God's gift to us, something of the glory of God. Uh, if we are not to be an idolater, everything that we love, we love for God. We love God through loving them. And like any normal husband or wife, the Lord is determined not simply to be our highest God, not to be our favorite, our favorite among the, our harem of lovers. He determines to be the only one. He's monogamous and he's jealous. God wants no competition for our worship. We are not to worship the angels who help him or the saints who have been especially close to him in the past. All such attempts to make other objects of devotion, no matter what you call it, whether praying to or, th or through them, seeking their aid uh, to get to the Father, uh, you know, if you really want the father to listen to you, um, talk to Mary because Mary is Jesus' mother and, and so, you know, Jesus will definitely do what his mother tells him to do and then Jesus is close to the father. So, so you know, you got to have connections, right? Connections. Everyone knows if you want to do well in society, you've got to have connections. Same with God. Go through him connections. No, he, all, he blows all that away. The only connection you need is right with God himself. Don't seek intermediaries. Uh, venerating people who were, you think were close to the Lord. All of that is forbidden. It is idolatry. The people who do that may think they have good intentions, but they're making something for themselves, not really for God. And the Lord is jealous and does not tolerate it. Uh, the Hebrew word for jealous denotes an intense emotional reaction to any affront to, to God's glory. This prohibition is not something that's cold and, and stern, some just restriction legalistic like it's not like some policeman telling you not to litter you don't really care but it's just his job or some teacher telling you to do your homework uh, this is something God is passionate about uh, he is intensely passionate about worship that it be done his way for his glory he expects passionate obedience passionate worship in return so that means boredom with God Boredom with his word. This is, oh, I got to read, I got to do, I got to come to church. Oh. It's an insult to his passion for worship. We saw in the first chapter of Isaiah last fall, if you remember, you can read it again, Isaiah 1, that the Lord told the Israelites that their worship, that their offerings, they were vain. Their incense, what they offered in worship, even they did it according to the law, but even if they did it the right way, was an abomination. That he could not endure their assemblies. And they're, off, they're supposed to leave for him. But he, doesn't, he hates it. His language is heated, white hot, with the intensity of his feeling. God hates 
hypocritical worship. He hates worship that disgraces him. He hates worship that makes people think that he really isn't that important. He's just something you got to endure for an hour until we can get to the, to the restaurant and before the Methodists do. That other interests are loyalties like the nation or to the family or to whatever. You know, whatever's on TV at noon, all of that is more important than he is. It's not a light thing. It's something the Lord deeply, angrily despises. And so he says in the second half of verse 9 that he visits the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third grandchildren and fourth great-grandchildren generation of those who turn away from right worship. He equates violating this command. Notice he says he, he, calls, it that, he calls that hating him. Notice that? They, they, they think, now these people think, well, I just prefer this way of doing things. Or I'm just I'm not into that kind of thing. But God is saying, you hate me. That's what's going on when you're turning away from right worship because you hate me. You deg- uh, in, in, at the end of verse 9, those who disobey this commandment, who degrade the worship of God, who promote rivals to him, who treat him as though he, he's not worth that much attention or interest, or those, he says, hate him. And that's, that's different than we think. Because we usually think boredom, which is one way people now hate God. We, we think boredom is it's a lack of interest, something cold. It's a lack of strong feelings. Well, hate is, a, is intense. It's hot. It's a lot of strong feelings. But here the Lord says that those who can't muster the interest in him to worship him right, they actually hate God. They're not cold about him. They're they're against him. That's why the casual, disinterested approach to God is the most dreadful thing. It's, it's hatred toward God. Fair to give God the passionate, wholehearted worship he deserves is to hate him. And here the Lord says he visits that iniquity on our, our children. It means he'll come around and bring it on the children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. In other words, God says that he will bring the consequences of our failure on the heads of our descendants. Now, something that sounds too harsh uh, for a, a God of love to do. And certainly, he doesn't mean that if they, even if they repent, if I turn away from God's right worship, but my children don't, and they, they turn back to him, that doesn't mean he's going to continue. But it means likely if I turn away from the Lord, there's a greater likelihood that my children will. And so will their children, and on and on. But some people think, well, God, he's not going to actually visit this punishment on descendants is he they, so they try to skate around it imagine that he's just saying he allows people to reap the consequences for their own bad behavior and and there is some truth to that sin has its own ill effects sin often has consequences for the, for the whole family the man who trusts in his alcohol to escape from his problems that has consequences for his family trust in his anger to meet his needs well that has consequences for his for his family they suffer the consequences of him not being able to truly revere and serve god but notice here in the last half of verse 9 that God doesn't just say that he passively leads us, us, us to suffer the consequences of our own bad decisions. It's not as though punishment is, is just built into the sin. Maybe there's some of that. But some, and God just leaves it up to us to receive. It's not just that. No, the verse says that the Lord visits. That is, he actively and heatedly punishes the one who will not worship him aright. He does it. It's not just laws of the universe that he doesn't stop. People who will not revere him enough to treat him as the one worthy of exclusive and right worship. He intentionally visits their punishment on them. And not just on them, on their descendants. Now some might object, well that's not fair. But friends, what is not fair is that we teach our children, either by words or by modeling, that the Lord is not worthy of worship. That's not fair. You see, we all sacrifice our children to one God or the other. You got to make your mind up which, which God you're going to sacrifice your children to. All parents routinely ask our children to suffer because of our values, and well, we should. If we think sports or work or school or socializing is more important and more interesting than the Lord, we'll teach that lesson to our children. They'll see it in our priorities. They'll see it in those things we, we just can't miss or what we can easily miss. They'll see it in our choices when we have to decide over one thing over another. They'll see it in where our interest is at, on what we discuss around the dinner table, on what we spend a lot of time doing or listening to, 
and what we're really not interested in at all. They'll, they'll see that we could spend a lot of money on vacations and nice cars and maybe tattoos, and, but giving to the spread of the gospel, uh, nah. We will either teach our children that God is worthy of exclusive worship, that he is someone being worth being passionately interested in, or if, you know, I mean, come on, let's be real. This is just boring religion. We'll either teach our children to love the Lord as far as we can, or we'll teach them to hate him. And if we teach them to hate him, to hate him by not giving him the exclusive passionate worship that he is worth, then our iniquity will be visited on them. So who are you going to sacrifice your children to? To the Lord for their blessing or to your cold, bored hatred of him for their curse? Why worship him right? Well, not only is he jealous, that's one reason, and this is the consequences of those who hate him on, on, uh, on their descendants. But also, the second reason why to worship him right, he shows, famous term, steadfast love. In Hebrew, chesed. Uh, that devoted commitment to love. That loyal love, like Ruth showed. He, show, he has that steadfast love to those who love him. And notice again in verse 6, it's the language of passion. It's a language of love and of hate. It's not simply good enough to keep his commandments. He says, we need to keep them for the right reason. You know, the Pharisees made a good show of keeping his commandments, but they kept them for the wrong reason. Deep down, they hated God, and they thought that by keeping the commandments, they could control God, that they could earn the rewards from him, like the way you can buy mafia protection. Not because you love the Godfather, oh, I just love the mafia boss, and I want to give him money, but because you want to keep him off your back. Obedience is not enough. God says here that he keeps steadfast love to those who love him, uh, to the people who are, have the same passion for his glory that he does, who understand that worship is not by the people, of the people, and for the people, that is for God, that he is worthy. People with that passion, that love for the Lord, those the Lord loves loyally. And if we love the Lord, it will show in our keeping his commandments. Notice at the end of verse 10, the blessing comes on those, those who love me and keep my commandments. Those are two different groups of people. Okay? He doesn't say those who love me or keep my commandments. As though you can do either one. You can love him or you can keep his commandments. Either one's okay. Uh, no, they're the same group of people. They love him and keep his commandments. Now, some think they can obey without love, like the Pharisees. And others think they can love without obeying, like a lot of people today. But both are wrong. Where there is obedience without love, like the Pharisees, is, is servile. It is, it's not the worship in spirit and in truth that we must, I remember must, offer to God. But when there is so-called love without obedience, uh, that's just self-serving sentimentality. This is empty, gushy words. It's just froth. Um, we see this in people who profess to love God but who can't stand to be restricted by what the word of God says on how to worship him, on how to serve God with their bodies by not being intoxicated or by giving him, or by not giving into sexual immorality, about serving God with their tongues or the words they say or with their work, uh, who talk a good game, but their, their money shows where their treasure is. We have people who claim to love him and may claim to love us, and they say that's enough. Just the claim, just the words, just the profession, just the gushing emotion. But the Lord Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 23, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. First John chapter 3, verse 18 says, Let us not love in word or talk. Oh, I love you. I, I love this church. I'll never leave. But in deed and in truth. Love and obedience go hand in hand, at least when it comes to God. If you don't have one, you don't have the other. Those who love God keep his commandments. They sacrifice their children to him. They teach their children in words and deeds 
that God is worth serving, that he is worth passion and interest and attention. And so God blesses them, and he blesses their children to the thousandth generation. He is overflowing in his exuberant desire to do good to those who see that God and God alone is worth glorifying. Do you see that? 